Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books, the kids' fiction imprint of Cannon Press. So I followed the ghost of a king with every step I try. Hold on a minute before I let you get to this wonderful episode of Stories Are Soul Food. I have to tell you something. Some of you all who have been asking for video, well, your desires have been answered because this episode is now streaming on Canon Plus in video. So if you, for some reason, have wanted to see my face or Nate's face, you now can do that. Or if you've wanted to see how Nate wears his headphones, or uh, I don't know what clothes he uh, records stories or soul food in, uh, you can now do that. MyCanonPlus.com. And of course, use code SASF99 after you create your free account. Enter that for a month of Stories or Soul Food and 99 cents. And of course, all the other things on Canon Plus. All right, I'll get out of your way and let you listen to the episode because it's a doozy, as they say. But restlessness was my problem. What were we talking about today, Brian? Well, Welcome to Stories <laughs> or Soul Food, everybody. It's another... It's not the 4th of July, but we're talking about it. Yeah. Because we missed all of last week for podcasting. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we should record on the holiday. Yeah. Which is good. <laughs> that is we funny. missed the work days. We're recording on the holy day, although it's not a holy day. Apologies. Yeah. It is kind of. Yeah. A little bit. I mean, divine providence and all a that. A gracious day. Well, we were being protested. A day of grace. We like theocracy, apparently. So <laughs> people who like theocracy can't also like independence. They can't is, like is, freedom. Is the main. But that's false because here I stand doing both. Yeah. Uh, anyways, the question that I have for you today, you might have seen zooming around the interwebs, a uh, sub stack. Letter. Probably not. I don't see things on the interwebs usually. <laughs> okay. And others of you probably didn't see either, but uh, um, a, a blog on the missing heroic feminine. And I know that title doesn't sound good, but I want to ask you about it. Okay. Um, because the idea actually is kind of interesting. The idea is that... Um, feminism proper sort of derailed our discovery of of what an what a what an actual female hero would look like so we're kind of stuck between the complainy feminist one and joseph campbell's more masculine story structure and that, so that was my first question do you think campbell's structure of the hero's journey fits better for for a male story nope i think it works for everyone yep there, we're done. <laughs> we did the podcast. <laughs> Campbell was once asked like uh, some something about, you know, one of his disciples. And, you know, he's not a Christian or anything, but one of his disciples said, tried to apply this to women. And he said, women don't have a heroic journey. They're the place everyone's trying to get, which I didn't know what that meant, but it's a pretty weird sort of Campbellian. It makes you know, sense. Uh, thing. Yeah. Women as destination. Yeah. So this guy was basically saying we had many stories over the course of thousands of years to understand what it looks like to be a hero from the Gre greco roman perspective up till now but then we had a huge change in the 1900s where women sort of had a massive change in their roles and didn't get a chance to sort of develop that same sort of heroic structure oh those poor people yeah well <laughs> his idea was more those just four fictional characters who never existed <laughs> I, I actually i think this is a crock you think so yeah i okay. think it's a total crock you think it's just not you know it fits perfectly 100 percent festering nonsense <laughs> <laughs> okay well maybe maybe then i'll continue to push you with what he thinks the the, the heroic feminine does and find out if you agree with these or okay. if, how it fits let's, let's dive into this festering nonsense and see if there's <laughs> a, a morsel or two <laughs> <laughs> okay um so my the question he has and again a lot of this is well you know i won't say that yet um so he and actually will wrap up i'll go, remind me to go full cambellian on you at okay the end. all right okay uh so here we go he, he says a hero challenges an external threat, but a heroine challenges the hero. And not to push back, but I feel like your heroines often do that. Like that's kind of their role. I'm especially thinking of Antigone. She is sort of a challenger of, um, th that's what her role is. She pushes back on Cyrus and she doesn't win all the time. She's not some sort of subversive female who's trying to subvert his mission but she does push back on him pretty regularly. So anyways, uh, what do you think about that point? Can we make that distinction? No. 
I mean, if it is a, <laughs> if it is in fact a croc, then we're going to get solid nose on all of these. <laughs> so that is, I mean, I think you have to start by defining the term. Okay. Uh, if you're talking about heroin, uh, heroin, as you were saying, if we're going to go with that as, <laughs> so as we're not confusing with the, uh, the straight to the vein drug. <laughs> um, we're talking about a heroine who's the actual protagonist, the, cent the central protagonist in the story versus a two-hander as we would say, like dual protagonists or a secondary character. Okay. Uh, and Ashtown ricochets, wanders the line between a two-hander and uh, also Antigone, a secondary character. Okay. So it's, there's, there's places where she is secondary character and there's places where it really is, especially early, the two, the two of them together. And She's not the she's not the protagonist. I've not written a story there where she is the central protagonist. If she is the true heroine, then no, that's not what she's doing. Uh, as, okay. as far as a description of what she's doing in the two hander story or in uh, in that secondary role, absolutely, she is pushing against Cyrus. She is she is that uh, that peer review. She is in the struggle. She is in this perpetual state of struggle with her brother over who is protecting whom and you know she has this desire this instinct to protect him and he has this this desire to not be protected and to protect her and they both have deep loyalty to each other you know absolutely unquestionable loyalty to each other and that gives you lots of character dynamics but basically some of that is just that you need perpetual friction in the story and perpetual perpetual motion between characters so so the follow-up might actually just be that if you have um if you have a supporting character then yes they're going to have conflict with the main character whether or not no matter what no matter whether one is doesn't matter if it's it's, or it's male or female does not matter just the, okay. the nature of the the simple fact of being a supporting slash secondary character is like means that if you are doing a t if you're writing a two-hander and both of your leads are male it's going to do that as well gotcha i was thinking frodo and sam obviously sam's a bit they're different classes too but even that sam does friction push. friction constantly constant and, friction and, who is protecting whom who's actually in charge right and Gollum adding in there that's the big one where sam really disagrees with frodo on what Gollum's purpose but, is. but throughout you see you see sam is the follower but followers frequently take ownership uh like take ownership of the leader mm -hmm. and like they they actually will do that like they are the ones who own the leader i own you mm -hmm. and i'm going to protect you and i'm going to yeah. serve you and this service of you is the nature of my ownership and so male female doesn't matter you'll see that with any kind of uh, yeah. alpha beta dynamic yeah um, well, speaking of our 4th of July parade, I saw a woman refusing to shake your father's hand at the parade. And I felt that same sort of followers like quick, get in and help out. And then I realized, slap her. <laughs> I realized that you're uh you're my pastor doesn't need my, my help on that. He's quite fine with jovially refusing to have his hand shaken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, leaving his hand unshook. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's probably germs. She's just worried about germs. Yeah. It's all COVID <laughs> COVID fears. Okay. Second point then. We, we've we've thrown out the first one of five so yeah we would just say that's true of every secondary character okay and even if you're in a true you know true two-hander double protagonist it's true there too okay gotcha um uh the the heroine is a bulwark against disaster and a store of wisdom so mm -hmm. her role rather than being the one who goes out and fights is the one who's the community focused <laughs> i heard you snicker so <laughs> the heroine is the one who makes stew <laughs> <laughs> is that is that a bulwark against disaster <laughs> um that one's kind of hard to define i think um and this is man i i can't tell you this stuff because you're just gonna make fun of it but he's 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 arguing this from partly from he's got some evolutionary psychology behind here because he says uh, there are only certain mammals that have a uh, uh, females who are, are maintain that sort of alpha female role. And those ones with an older woman, like we're talking whales here <laughs> mm. or humans do better in times of disaster. Is this ridiculous? Brian, you don't need to ask me that. 
<laughs> okay, but here's my second qu- part of the question. I think your main heroes do that. Like that, what do you see in... <laughs> <laughs> he groans in pain. What do the what do the the women in your stories do? I'm thinking of Ashdown here, uh, or the Hunter Cupboards, especially Henrietta. What does yeah. she do? Screws no. everything up. She <laughs> is the disaster. <laughs> okay, all right. How about how about? But without Henrietta, we wouldn't have got. <laughs> what about what about Henry's mom? I can see her and the grandma as fulfilling that role for you, though, in your story. What disaster is she a bulwark against? Well, I suppose, I suppose she's, you know, she is a victim of massive disaster. Mm-hmm. But I think in a sense, she's the reason they're still the family, right? It just means she's a survivor. She's lost her husband. She's lost her sons. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is Campbellian. She's the one to whom they return. Okay. All right. So. So again, you, you she's say, home. She is homecoming. Okay. That's who that's who Hyacinth is. And now if we jump over to the door before and we look at Hyacinth in the door before, we have something a little different. What's she doing in the door before? Having an adventure. Because she's the main character. <laughs> so yeah, well, yeah, but even there, uh she's yeah, she's the main character. She's a main character. Right. And she's having an adventure. Her world, she's she's in that fairy tale story where She's actually a, a, a girl in a, in a, you know, in a California house where things go nuts. Okay. All right. Third one. <laughs> All right. Third one. And uh, a lot of these are taken from watching Miriam, the character Miriam in the Bible, which may be where some of their difficulties are. <laughs> uh, the typological reading here. Um Looking specifically at when a hero fails, usually the consequences fall on them directly. His, this guy's claim is, or actually, I don't know if this is a guy who's writing. Uh, but when a heroine fails. I like you're still saying heroine. <laughs> heroine. <laughs> when a heroine fails, the community suffers mm. primarily. Do you see support for this outside of the story of Miriam? Let's say if a freshman turned this in so far to me back when I was teaching the NSA, they would, they would be failing. Okay, hence uh, you see that the the threshold for Substack is lower. I'm I'm glad that my bold assertion at the outset that this was festering nonsense has <laughs> not proved to be false. I'm not stuck having to retract anything. I had to prepare my soul, being like, okay, I said that. Now I have to be prepared to backtrack and then <laughs> eat crow here on camera and into the microphone. And it turns out, no, the crow is going unet. This is ridiculous okay fourth one synonym dumb <laughs> <laughs> fourth one has the guy read a book whoever wrote this i don't even know it's an anonymous sub stack maybe oh, good i'm glad i don't know who i'm insulting but this is really bad maybe they wanted to avoid your uh this is ri- my wrath your wrath uh, this is really poor also not from someone i know sorry this is really poor so. when guys screw up the consequences do not follow on the community yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's probably just his his <laughs> case study of Miriam and then who else did they oh. pick from this? Yeah, their example here. Um all right. A heroine binding and building a community. Community focus there. Can you disagree with that one? You just think it doesn't cover anything. Maybe you need to go full Campbellian on us sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um but I mean, that one seems to make sense. Doesn't to you? No. You just think it doesn't have to. You think you have some some feminine characters who are building and binding community together, as opposed to a heroic one who more goes out. No, I don't. I, I don't have a clue why what that even means. Hmm. Binding and building community. They can't. I'm like a woman cannot bind and build community. Okay. She can't. Neither can a guy. It's only together. It's only together. The two of them <laughs> shall become one. <laughs> um, it, make, it makes me think of the Jim Gaffigan wedding skit, which we should just play without any kind of license right now. <laughs> He's talking about weddings where, you know, we love each other. Let's pretend we have a kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'm familiar. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> 
And then your your parents' friends and my parents' friends will come together and we'll have a banquet. <laughs> and it's <laughs> and the two kingdoms shall become one. Okay. Um so it's mythologizing. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> uh you can a, a woman can't do that. Uh, neither can a guy. Okay. I mean that's just the dance of the two. So still dumb. Still dumb. Okay. All right. This, then, this whole this whole thing sounds like an enterprise in sucking raw eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can get the last one. <laughs> okay. The last one I thought was the worst, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. I look forward to it. <laughs> Let me take another sip of Dutch Brothers Latte. Okay. Ready? So the last one, their idea, and he's he's trying to read. Um, again, this comes from some some bad understanding of nature. But basically looking at Greek mythological figures like Nemesis and the fates and the sirens as being feminine. And it's trying to look at the, what is the the female purpose of selecting or judging. And again, I don't see how that applies necessarily to fiction. (laughs) He's still getting the groans of pain. Uh, I saw this shared far and wide. So, you know, I wanted to share it with you. Uh, Why? 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 (laughs) There's a reason why I stay off the internet. (laughs) Um, um, oh yeah. gosh Why, I mean I guess the idea of um, in some sense I guess you're you're probably going to say the same thing that depends on the judge the judge doesn't have to be female doesn't have to be male we can have a Deborah we can have a, a, Mi- a Minos I don't know a wise character male or female will judge a okay. foolish character male or female will judge foolishly yeah and will fail I mean, it's just that's just how it is yeah so we we had an early episode audio only no cameras for that but we did had that early episode on mentors so you're saying again you're far more egalitarian than some would give you credit for nope <laughs> <laughs> just not stupid <laughs> so you um can we jump into why or you how you think everything is completely Campbellian? Do we need to find that? First? No, it's not all completely Campbellian. It's just there are there are different roles for sure, and um, but the the fact is that everything's in ratio, right? So male and female dynamics, and even good uh, good two hander protagonists, good secondary characters, it's always in relationship. And so when you say, and this is, this is one of the things that drives me bonkers about anybody who starts talking about gender roles in, in like big sweeping terms is, is they want to classify whole categories uh, with the single suitcase handle instead of actually handling uh, the individual. Now I understand there are generalizations and that's fine, but if you're talking about heroes and stories, uh, you have characters like Eowyn, right? So if we're going into the Lord of the Rings, we're talking about the character of Eowyn. What is she? Yeah. I mean, she's an interesting character for sure. She's bold. She's a shield maiden. She wants to go out and have adventures, and she she's striving to be out there fighting and mattering and not being a nursemaid of a doddering old fool. And everybody... Oh, well, not everybody, but I've heard plenty of people be like, this is, this is this discontentment, you know, this, this frustration, this discontentment that she, that she has with her station. It's like, no, it has nothing to do with her station. She's sitting here. If she was, if she was following a king who was being a king, she would have no problem at all. The problem that she had was that Theoden was rotting in his throne. He was abdicating. He was weak. He was listening to Wormtongue and he was destroying his house and his kingdom with his own weakness and abdication. And she could not sit there in that rot anymore. She's looking for a real king. She's looking for a, like, mm. she, she wants that. She wants that real place. She wants that real home. She's not that real home. She wants that, okay. that real home, that real king, that real kingdom. This is why she falls immediately for Aragorn. Like he's a real king. He comes through and it's like, there's, he's kingly, he's masculine, he's aggressive. He is, he's doing all the things that Theoden should be doing. The ruler of her house, the ruler of her people. And she just wants so badly wants to be there doing those things. 
And so when she dresses up as Dernhelm and, and goes and flees, she's fleeing like this, this horrible, horrible circumstance. And, and she is doing it in a way that's despairing and broken. You know, she's doing that thing. She basically, she's throwing herself off the tower. You know, she's, yeah. you know, it's not the right choice, like okay. she, but she's, she's reaching this place of utter despair and she's throwing herself off the tower. Right. Her brother mm. was imprisoned. You know, it's like, yeah. Like, and now final, finally, finally, her King is riding out. Like this real King came through and, and finally Theoden's going and she's supposed to stay back. The one time she has a real king, like she's not okay. She's not going to go follow her king, um, and so she she goes and she you know lies and she sneaks and she goes. Um, and in that, I think there's there's something honorable and there's something great. Now, re- looking at it through our lens right now, like what we'd see culturally, like yeah, no, there's there's plenty to be nervous about, right? You but, you mean like people who take her as some sort of feminist icon yeah is that what we're talking about okay. yeah you know she's in drag she's you know, right whatever but the thing is she's incredibly strong she's incredibly courageous and it's a but it's about the ratio so about the relationship she needs she needs a hero she needs a king who is even stronger like mm-hmm. that she can really truly follow so she wants that she's she's looking for those that fortress she's looking for that home where she can be in a fortress, like actually following uh, somebody truly kingly. And there's no regret, obviously, because she's fulfilling a prophecy in being there. Mm -hmm. She's the one that tips the scales of the battle through being there. She gets to be there for the ultimate like peak of nobility for Theoden, the man that, you know, she's followed and loved despite his rottenness. Mm -hmm. And then even after that, she is still broken and still dying in despair. And then until Aragorn comes and Aragorn basically commands her to knock it off. (laughs) You know, it's Mm -hmm. like, it's like, stop. But then like gives, like gives her to Faramir. And in that is like something that's really ancient. And there's something kind of shockingly wise there that, that Tolkien does. Like Faramir is, also kingly is also incredibly noble is also strong and sacrificial is more is more than enough like he is this great hero Mm -hmm. also but also self-sacrificial courageous and so on so the two of them pair beautifully like faramir and eowyn pair like way more beautifully than she would pair with aragorn gotcha you know it's like yeah and so that right there when she gets she goes on this on this heroine's journey what does she find like she finds a home like she finds a place okay you know it's like that's and it's not um because she finds a king she finds like she finds her like a purpose this is where this is now the nation she's going to mother she's going to mother a nation here Uh, that's very unique to this particular mythology in this particular world but she is not the and she's unique in in this way because she's not the home someone else is trying to find she is not the princess being rescued she is at sea she's lost like okay she is this incredibly strong woman who's who's broken because of the brokenness of the men in her house and and because of that brokenness she's at sea and then she's found her port gotcha she's found that in in faramir so would you view her you know fleeing you know she was sent to sit with the old men and the children basically uh before yeah. and that's what she leaves behind it is she let she fled the community yeah the thing that like she fled all of that now in finding faramir now the two of them mm-hmm. like now the two of them are a home and now the two of them will make a kingdom the two of them are now a thing um and so there is a way in which faramir has now found a home as well right like he's in her he's he's found his home so there is i think i'm cambellian in that uh women whether they are uh wrecked you know it's like whether they are like sort of at sea like she is mm-hmm. or under just traditionally fairy tale and he's he's going more fairy tale like women uh 
you know, damsels, he goes very damsels in distress. Right. You know? Yeah. But I think that distress is all over the place. It can be anywhere. Right. It can be of their own making, can be of, of another's making. Mm -hmm. um, and can be the the solution can be a lot of there's a lot of solutions it can be a, right a so lot you, of you kind of see she staying for her almost would have i mean obviously you can't retell the story but staying for her wouldn't have necessarily been a good move either would have like, been horrible would have been a terrible would have been betrayal terrible. of what she knew was good yep and what she knew needed to happen yeah with with rohan yeah it would have been a, it would have been a terrible betrayal of her call okay and so the what what you see in these in these kinds of stories is you see a, a man without a kingdom, a man without a place. He is now the heir of the stewards of Gondor, and as far as he's concerned, there is no more use for the stewards of Gondor. Faramir, like there's this this office has has reached its end. Mm -hmm. Now Aragorn will continue it, but we don't know that. He doesn't know that. Like. His father, his older brother's dead. His father's burned himself alive, uh, having ultimately just failed. Yeah. Like the line has just has just catastrophically failed. Yeah, the steward failed, right? The, the steward. steward failed, was com was absolutely corrupted and corrupted by the darkness he was supposed to be fighting against. His brother was corrupted by the darkness. His father burned himself alive and tried to kill him. He is he is wrecked and without a home. Mm-hmm. Faramir is wrecked without a home and without a king. Eowyn is wrecked and without a home and without a king. And they find each other and they find a king. It's like the two, so the two come together and they now have actually, they, they can now build the line of the stewards. And the line of the stewards can actually be built on a solid foundation of two people who were broken by unfaithful fathers, unfaithful, uh, mm. unfaithful houses, and it's just this shrapnel of wreckage that right. they're both surviving, and then they they find each other. Yeah, and the external threat too, of yep. course. Yeah. And you know, but even that's actually irrelevant. That's actually completely irrelevant to <clears throat> like their character journeys. Their character journeys, like the Mordor and all that stuff, whatever. What really matters is that uh, Ro Rohan was rotten, mm -hmm. like rotten to the core. Her family, her house, the whole thing was rotten. She had no king. She had no purpose. She had no place. Yeah. He has no king. His whole family has existed to be babysitting for the, for the king. And his father, you know, suicides and right. You know, his brother's gone chasing power, you know, dies with with nobility at the end, but he chased power, was corrupted by it. Right. And he's this like last survivor who made the faithful choice and uh has been noble. And so when the two of them actually get through that, the reason why there is such a catharsis and such a resolution in the Faramir Eowyn story is because they're both coming out of such similar places. Hmm. Like they're, they're coming out of places of betrayal of, of their own lines and their own houses. And okay. they're both coming like converts. They're both like new believers in the story to a new king. So they both had to let go of everything that's previous. everything about their houses yeah everything you know at all they're like two new believers yeah you know one you know who is of some ancient line that has now been finally destroyed and another of a different one so you know it's like this the whole thing's been smashed mm -hmm. their lines have been smashed and destroyed and they both have now pledged loyalty to a new king together mm. and they're building a new line that's going to live in faithfulness to a new king. And so the the two come together and do that. And we know that Eowyn is going to be content and joyful and happy and healthy, both because her king is strong, like the king is good. The mm -hmm. king, the kingdom will be led with nobility and righteousness uh, and not an abdication. But also her own, like her own man now, Faramir, is himself incredibly strong. And incredibly you know faithful and has passed all the tests that he could possibly pass mm -hmm. and you know yeah. and and also understands and relates to the depth of the despair that she saw right so he's capable of walking all the way into that darkness and coming all the way out with her so the two of them uh coming together there it's not uh 
the ratio of his strength, her strength. Yeah. All of that is right. Okay. Um, all of it's right. Now, a lot of people kind of get um, confused around AO, and I think she's a perfect example that just kind of refutes a lot of the points you just walked through. <laughs> so if you had written a story, a novel that focused on Eowyn's journey, just Eowyn, mm -hmm. and just told her story, uh, it'd be a great novel. Okay. You know, it's like, and she could be the main character. And it would have been hero's journey. So departure, yep. initiation, yeah, exactly. return, all those three steps yep. of the Kimbellian story. And out there, she would have gone into another kingdom, been fighting in foreign fields. You know, it's like, and she there would have been this other character we would have established in Faramir. And she could have been the lead, and Faramir could have been the secondary. And yet, by the end, like, she, she and Faramir could be coming together, and it would be a, a great story. Okay. So... Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So you're saying there's not really a fundamental, again, and this is like you've talked about, it's a lens question. Through God's lens, we all have that heroic journey that we're following through, mm -hmm. you know, in our particular situation. So trying to zoom in on a particular, say, and say all of the female characters in a story follow this archetype is not, is, it's, it's going to, it's, yeah, it's going to depend. It's dumb. Okay. Yeah. So. Esther's story, Ruth's story, Tamar's story, Rahab's mm -hmm. story. Yeah. They all are heroic. Okay. You know, they Departure, all, initiation, return. They're, they're all, yeah, they're all heroic. So, so fundamentally, you're saying Campbell just is, are you making Campbell so generic, though, that it can fit anything? Or do you think he just is trying to be that generic? Because I guess, I guess if we're saying Campbell is honestly just, you know, you have a problem, you go out, and then you come back. So I mean, it's it's so not it's not all go out. I don't think it's all go out and come back. I think it's sometimes you go out and arrive. There's a, there's an Odyssean thing to it where you can go out and come back, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also, and of course, with the Odyssey, we're just coming back. You know, it's like it's more like we just go out and arrive. Um, but you can also be be the pioneers heading west, and you find the valley. You've you know you'll know when you see it. <laughs> you find the valley and you homestead and. Right. You know, it's like that's you survive the winters, you get through the past. You know, it's like it's there's a there's journeys, like there's actually heroic journeys that don't involve the going back. They involve building a new home. They involve like the new place. You know, it's like it's and okay. and of course, typologically, in terms of in terms of the archetype, you came back, you're at home now, right? Gotcha. So you left a home. And you've gone out, you've had the right. hero's journey, and you are now arrived at your new home. Yeah. Uh, it's not the same home. Right. Did you get that from Campbell? No. Okay, that's what I was going to say. It just, um, yeah, you just think that's that's just life study. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just more the nature of narrative. Um, okay. And I don't think he would disagree. You know, I, th I think that's that, kind of his point, I guess, is that psychology. I mean, he's, yeah. he's a psychologist. Yeah. And so I, th I actually think that Campbell is a bit of a twit, but I don't, I think a lot of what he boils down is accurate, but over prescriptive okay. sometimes. And I think this is usually the case with anybody who gets typological. Mm -hmm. So they, they get excited to find the typology. And I've, I've complained about this before and I specifically with Harry Potter and other things. They, yeah. They, get good at identifying typology. And then they, as soon as they identify typology, they try to make it this authoritative, you know, meaning structure that they impose on stuff as opposed to things, uh, you know, that actually can point out similarities or echoes or bring resolutions. Could you have good dragons? Of course we can have good dragons. Obviously we can have good dragons. Okay. You know, can we invert? uh archetypes of course we can invert archetypes you know of course we can play with you know of course we can play with negatives of course we can play with upside down stuff you know like there's all okay. sorts of okay because god does ultimately the rules are just which which things does god do oh uh, what are the things he does what are the things he likes um i was just having a discussion with some of my family members some um, nieces about Flannery O'Connor and we're finite. And so we can't tell all the stories that God tells, but we can't object to the kinds of stories he tells either. And so while I don't care for O'Connor's novels, her short fiction uh, is pretty triumphant. I think it's amazing. 
And we can find those stories all over the place. It's just a question where you place the frame and what are you doing? Yeah. yeah. And and what what specifically you're talking about is the the Flannery story that ends so badly. Except for it doesn't. It's it's for me, O'Connor short stories are all short stories of about a super righteous young Jew who believes himself to be so righteous that he's he's committing perjury and mm -hmm. arranging for kangaroo trials and murdering actually righteous people. Yeah only to be knocked off his donkey and blinded. Okay. And that's where we end the short story. So all yeah, the like O'Connor, like O'Connor is like, she tells these short stories that end with Paul knocked off his donkey. Mm -hmm. And there's just like, bah. like yeah. there's just like violent grace yeah. that shows up. And she's constantly, she has such a clear objective reality outside the storyteller. Yep. That, and some of her other ones seem to be running into that. Like the, the kid who gets baptized and drowns, you know, yep. for, you know, that sort of story. Yep. He, he, she's saying there's something outside of this kid that's bigger than yep. his, you know, poisonous little. little and I, I think her, story. I think her perception of violent grace is accurate. And I think once her own religious perception is broken, when she gets into theological exploration beyond that. And so when she tries to explore in big, longer fiction, I think she gets more lost. And so in, in scenes and characters and, uh, in any, even in her novels, she can be fantastic in a, you know, in a, in a scene, uh, but her, her bigger explorations of the nature of metaphysical reality that plays out in the physical world, I think, I think breaks down. But so the ba basically, I think we look around at what God does and the kinds of stories that God tells, then we try to reduce it into miniature yeah, and strip it down such that we can repackage it for finite imaginations because we don't have the patience. Yeah. Like we just don't. And I was uh, having a conversation with my father about the destruction of tech giants and these multi-trillion dollar companies that we're going to be dealing with mm -hmm. and the wildly dystopian things that our tech uh, private industry can do and is working on. And we all, you know, we're post mill and there's a God in heaven and towers of Babel never succeed. But the question is if we're dealing with empires, empires get smashed but do they get smashed in human lifetimes <laughs> like yeah like they get they get like persia falls the greek empire falls the british empire falls rome falls but and god uses it for good and god uses it for his purpose but when those giant things actually clash and collapse being post mill doesn't mean that i think they're going to fall tomorrow or even in my life they mm -hmm. might fall in my lifetime. They might not. Yeah. They might last a thousand years and then rot and fall. Yeah. You know, like, well, I mean, it's funny thoughts to be having on the 4th of July, but I was having the same thing. It's like, hey, if we're going to last a thousand generations and we're a tiny ways into a thousand, right? Because yep. the Bible promises that. Like, America is not sticking around for that whole nope. time. I mean, you, I've studied enough history just to be like... You don't get that long with an, an yeah, empire. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember which episode it was where I talked about institutions. Yeah, and we were talking about institutions. Institutional rot, that's a good And you one. were asking me about my fiction seems so so cynical about institutions. And yeah. It's because institutions are mortal. Like yeah. Institutions are our way to try to reach outside of our own lifespans, but they, like us, are mortal. And so countries fail, empires fail. They're just big trees. Yeah. And they can seem like, man, this tree is going to live forever, but it's a tree. It won't. Yeah. yeah like ultimately, it's going to yeah. fall. And that shouldn't cause you to have some existential crisis of faith because right. your faith cannot be in the tree. I mean, you just got to watch. I mean, you know, it's funny. Annuals versus perennials as flowers. <laughs> 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 like some of those flowers, they get one summer and they got to reseed. You yep. know, you got that one summer and it's like you bloom and then that's it. And it was a great summer. <laughs> but if you got kids, they get a bloom next summer. Yep. They still got one summer. But <laughs> so we've, we've talked about the what are they, the mayflies who don't even have mouths. <laughs> yeah. You know, in their adult in their adult forms. I think it's mayflies. Whichever. Yeah. I know they're yeah. so I can picture the shot and I can hear Attenborough's yeah. voice. Yep. You know, watching them all swarm above the water. Yeah. And I, of course, I think I referenced Terry, <laughs> Terry Pratchett last time we were talking about this. Uh, you know, the older, the older flies saying like, in my day, the sun wasn't so red. <laughs> you know, it's like a few hours ago. <laughs> yeah. um, they, they are in their adult form, unable to even eat. They've got one full stomach. 
Okay. That's it. One gas tank. One gas tank. And in that gas tank, they have got to find a mate yeah. and, and uh, procreate and then die and fall into the water and feed the trout. I yeah. mean, that is like... The world must be mayflied. The, so. the trout must be fed. And so God is feeding trout. I mean, that's ultimately what he did. He tied off a trout feeding system. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all the mayflies are for. Um, but in, anyway, as far as we go, we have to look at the structures of, of narrative that, that God uses. And so in scripture and in the natural world and in history, like we have to, we have to look at those things and find the shapes and boil those down and find the structures that really bring, uh, really bring resolution and catharsis because they imitate the, the core structure that, that he's laid out, you know, the architecture under history. So Campbell touches a lot of that, but then, then what ends up happening is, is people will, will go about it the wrong way and they'll read a story that might be really compelling or have a great deal of resolution and catharsis. And they'll say, this is wrong. Yeah. Like this is incorrect because you know, instead yeah. of it being descriptive and like distilled from good storytelling, we go to the good stories and we distill these principles. We now take these principles and apply them back on yeah. stories to then say, it, this one's bad, that yeah. one's good. And it doesn't just, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Cause they'll say like act three didn't start with the refusal of the return. So this is a bad novel, you know? Yeah. And, and, and yeah, then I start, <laughs> then Nate just, I start doing that stuff again. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's nonsense. It's like, so these are, so sure. Campbell has 17 points. Yeah. And yeah, you can find those in a lot of stories. Yeah, you can boil those out and say, oh, this is interesting that these these are things that a lot of great stories have in common. And then when you find a story that is great, mm -hmm. like it's great, and you you don't tick off the little 17 points and say, oh, never mind, it's a 14 out of 17, it's bad, C minus or whatever. Mm. Um, or that would be like a C. But you don't you just don't do that. Um, yeah. You know, it's like you, you can't do it that way. You, ha you actually have to look at, what does God love? You need to get to know him well and his storytelling well. And then you need to be able to say, I think this is not true and good and beautiful in the way that his storytelling is true and good and beautiful in the following ways. Not that I have distilled these rules mm -hmm. and I'm going to impose these rules. Gotcha. Uh, because it's just dumb. Yeah. It's just completely dumb. The second dumb thing in yeah. today's episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not as dumb, not as dumb as those things we went through first. This is the lesser dumb, but it is, you know, and also it bothers me when people have narrative conversations around things where they, they are imposing their own taste and their own taste is not subordinate to the taste of God. Okay. And they say, they just say, I don't care for, or I feel like this doesn't, this isn't good. This isn't good. And I just feel like it'd be better if it'd be better if I just feel like I can't stand that stuff because then you say, uh, you mean, you mean, do you mean when they're objectively wrong or when no, I mean, actual I know, I mean, clash? Like, no, I, I mean, ought you to feel that way? Oh, what, where, how do you I falsify? See. How do you falsify or verify your yeah. own taste? You should be perpetually pursuing the falsification and verification of your own taste, the refinement of your own taste. Yeah. And that I see that is actually something that comes through scripture, history, yeah. Uh, great works of literature that have that have lasted, that have been tested by time. Yeah. And have lasted. Well, I remember reading Flannery at first as a as a high schooler because I'd been told it was great and it was tough. And I thought, yeah. I don't I don't like this. Right. But I also had that second thought of, but I've had so many people tell me there's something here that's key. Yeah. So then when I returned to it older, you know, you're immediately like, Oh, I get it. My first beer was really bad. Yeah. <laughs> it <laughs> that, was it was warm. It was Christmas morning and I was twelve. <laughs> okay it was you terrible have to explain the story for <laughs> what out of your stocking uh, yeah my mom put a beer in my stocking as a joke <laughs> and, and you thought well it's in my stocking and i i started to open my beer to drink it christmas morning and uh my mom was like no like no that was a joke you don't know no 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 it was like 9 a.m on christmas morning <laughs> like no and my dad was just like nancy you put it in there. <laughs> you gave it to him. He gets to drink it. And so yeah. I tried to drink it. It was terrible. Yeah. And it was like, it was horrendous. But I was all like, I'm going to have a beer on Christmas morning. And then it was, I got like two or three swallows down. I was like, this is really bad. What's that Calvin and Hobbes line? 
trusting parents can be hazardous to your health. Yeah. yeah. And so, but it was really, my, it was a hilarious joke. But then yeah. I was like, I'm drinking this joke. Mm. And my dad wisely didn't let my mom stop me. He let the taste stop me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, which it did immediately. Warm beer on a Christmas morning to a 12 year old. And that's, <laughs> I, what, that's what happened in the pastor's house. <laughs> it's like, you know, my dad was very much of the, if you're going to tell the joke, you see it through. If you're, the, if you're the pastor's wife who sticks a beer yeah. in the 12 year old boy's stocking. We've mentioned that before, but the, it would be funny if only works if they actually if do. If you do it. If you do uh, it. Wouldn't it be funny if? And so yeah, I didn't finish that beer. I didn't get very far. Um, yeah. But anyway, the, the point is with Isla whiskey or anything like that, like there's a certain amount of taste refinement, maturation and growth that requ- is required before you can see, before you can see things. And this is it. You know your taste is broken. How do you check if your taste is just broken? Hmm. Fully broken. And this is the easiest litmus test. Do you not like the Old Testament? Hmm. I mean, that's the easiest way. You heard it here. If folks. you don't like the stories in the Old Testament, it's broken. So there we go. Start yeah. there. It's like these are the stories that God chose. Like these are the stories he he told in this world, yeah. To lay the groundwork to to build up everything to the place where the New Testament is the payoff. Christ is the payoff to all of this, yeah. This groundwork and part of the not liking is just the not understanding it. That's been my favorite no, that, part where you really just are like, I don't understand, right? Why this is in here? But that is that's basically it's like taking a sip of of a, like I'll, I'll go with for for you. Uh, whiskey connoisseurs or taking a sip of Octomore, you know, which is a, a limited release from brood Lottie. So an, an, okay. Isla, an Isla whiskey, it's, it's my kids call it the dragon whiskey. It's like super, I mean, it, it's fire breathing. Okay. So all the smoke, all the heat, it's, it's as much a punch in the face as you could ever have, you know, this Octomore whiskey. And if you do it right, even more so, where you actually like put it in your mouth, you let it sit on your tongue, and like you're going to inhale through your nose. So you're not going to, you're not, you're going to taste it, nose it, do all these things without actually letting the oxygen get into the alcohol. Then you're going to inhale and you're going to exhale. And it's like, oh, like it just lights on fire. And you've got like a four minute finish where the flavor is just sitting hot in your mouth for four minutes. There are tons of people who would just be like, that sounds awful. <laughs> like that's a that sounds terrible uh that's fine you don't have that's unlike the old testament you don't, you don't have, have to, to like, like you don't have to like octomore um there's no requirement now it's amazing that god made the world in such a way that like you pe- can do people that on this with- island off of scotland have gotten really good at making the water of life as they called it at the very yeah. beginning uh, and they've gotten fantastic at this but when it comes to the story of samson like when it comes to David, uh, there's there was somebody at the Bible reading challenge who actually said that there was some comment somewhere that was like, well, you know, when I'm having a really bad day, at least I think, well, at least I'm not as bad as David. It's like, um, mm. oops, the, the man after, <laughs> the God's, man own after heart. God's own heart. So <clears throat> it's like, ah, yeah, the one who wrote how much of scripture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is. <laughs> there's the plenty one, of people to compare yourself against in scripture the, yeah the one At who least received you're not ahab <laughs> yeah the one who received the davidic promise yeah the one whose son is on the throne at the right hand of god the father and will be forevermore. At least you're not as bad as him um i think you probably are yeah oops good thing it's uh, not about but bad. the but the <laughs> point is when you read the old testament stories if you have the same sensation that you have trying to drink really smoky Isla whiskey and you're just like ah, I don't want that I don't want this this I can't hit what ha- take this away like I don't like the smoke I don't like the heat I don't like like no no thank you like, give me give yeah. me a drink with a like little umbrella in it and a ton of sugar I need a ton of sugar in my drink it's like well that's I mean that's you that's your problem if you have that reaction to the characters and the stories of the Old Testament, that you know your taste is out of alignment with the taste of God the Father. Like, mm. just full stop. Your taste is broken. It's your brokenness. And when you try to actually 
take your taste that is out of alignment with God's storytelling and you try to judge movies, novels, anything, anything that's pop, it's broken. You're, it's all the way broken. Like, okay. So you, you actually have to be more sophisticated. You have to actually look at the Old Testament stories differently. You need to start differently. You need to actually educate yourself. You need to be able to, to nose those stories and taste those stories and find the flavors and understand what is true and good and beautiful about this that you're missing because it's there, you're, but you're just missing it. It's like, and how are you missing it? And how does it pay off to the, you know, to the God man, to the incarnation, to the coming of Christ? Like, how does Samson hang, you know, like with the coming of the Messiah? How do these things hang together? How is this all one piece? You know, it's, you got to be able to hold that story in the glass and look at it and knows it and find the beauty of it and understand the power and the glory in that narrative. And if you don't, like if you, if you can't, if it's broken, if you can't see the, in, the intensity and the stakes of the story of Judah and Tamar, you're like, if you can't see that, uh, you're like, oh man, oof. Like that's just, that's just yuck. Um, and it is like yeah. not denying there's a lot of yuck there. Yeah. It's not like you're if, supposed to read it and be like, yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you are supposed to read it and think go Tamar. Yeah. You are supposed to read it and think Tamar just saved the world. Yeah. Job's another one like that. Yeah. Both of those. Yeah. And so if you're reading Job, if you're reading the story of Tamar and what Tamar had to do and what Tamar had to do to preserve the messianic line, like that through her came the messianic line through her, the world was saved through Tamar sitting by the side of the road, dressed as a prostitute, tricking her father-in-law, yeah. exposing his hypocrisy, but preserving the messianic line. Through that, the world was saved. If you can't find that, then your, your taste is out of alignment with the storyteller's taste, like the one who's actually crafting the narrative of your own life. So it's your life. He's the, he's the one writing this story that you live in, the story that your kids live in, the story of our time right now. And like, well, you better, you better start working. You better start working on your own your own taste. So do all your taste calibration in scripture. You better not. I, a friend of mine once told me she couldn't stand the apostle Paul. I was like, Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was like, Oh yeah. You know, he's <clears throat> so obnoxious. And I was like, well, okay. Don't ever find yourself saying that. Get yourself calibrated from scripture. Yeah. Like, calibrate from scripture, old and new, old and new testaments calibrate there. Uh, and having calibrated there, read history, look at the natural world and get to know your father even more and more and more and more. And then when you're judging stories, stories with your kids, films, shows, novels, uh, you, your taste will be in more and more alignment with the taste yeah. of the father as it should be. Well, you'll identify, oh, what I like about that drink is the sugar. Like that, this was a, this was a sugary drink. That's why I liked it when I was a kid. Yep. Or... Yeah. But I see that it doesn't Turns have Turns out otter pops are not actually all that. <laughs> the chef's kiss. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't mean don't hand one to your kid in the driveway on the 4th of July running around. You know, yeah, it's like, like it's, you have to wait till whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Octomore only in our house. It's like, <laughs> yeah. no, of course not. Uh, but it, it is really interesting to me how much people, they want checklists. They want to go through and say, what's the worldview of this, this particular story? And like, toggle good bad like they want to just do that and not look at any kind of sophistication of the of the of the flesh the incarnation of the story and they do the same thing with campbell they've done it they always want checklists yeah. is it prescriptively doing the following things and can i apply this grid of uh you know of grading to the narrative or to the heroine yeah or to whatever it might be and it's just problematic yeah it's just a really problematic way to do it so anyway, your Substack thing was stupid. <laughs> Campbell, uh, I think, is distilling a lot of things that are just true in the world, but not all, and should not be used as any kind of like grading guideline so much as, oh, isn't this interesting? Yeah. There's a lot of commonality here. Great. We're done. We're done. SASF number whatever. Oh, I don't. I forgot to check. SASF, where are we at 80? We're not at 80. Not yet. High 70s. Okay. There we go. Thanks for listening to Sasfa. 
We're very happy to have you all along on this ride with us. Appreciate all the feedback, all the questions, and all the good words from all the listeners around the country and even some internationally. Anyways, what I got for you right now is (laughs) the announcement that Fantastical Wordcraft, N.D. Wilson's School of, is actually on Canon Plus and available to listen to. Um, I think the last time I mentioned it, it was at some point in the future, but it's there now. So for the low, low price of 99 cents with code SASFA99, S-A-S-F-99, you can pay 99 cents for your first month, watch the course, and then if you can't find anything else to listen to, you can unsubscribe. Or you can stay subscribed to continue to support us and show us the love. Anyways, you might be asking, what is the School of Fantastical Wordcraft? It's basically Nate's 10 to 15 minute talks, nine of them, plus an intro on how to tell stories. So if you've ever wanted to tell stories, nonfiction or otherwise, um, and you thought, man, I should I should become a writer. I want to finish that novel. This is the course for you. Nate always says it's for kids as young as anyone who's ever said, hey, I want to be a writer when I grow up, and for adults as old as the same thing. So there you go. Some of my favorite lectures. I think the plot and outlining and story architecture chapters especially useful. And then, of course, uh, Nate's descriptions of how to write the basics are also key. Anyways, there's the pitch for N.D. Wilson's School of Fantastical Wordcraft, available on Canon Plus now. You can subscribe using that code SASF99 if you're a first-time subscriber and you go to mycanonplus.com.